Liminal Village is a space that's really uh, dedicated at uh, celebrating radical individuality is at the, and at the same time cultural responsibility. So we have some amazing panels coming up the rest of the afternoon. In fact, three panels happening back to back. So I invite you to stay for those or attend the ones that you have time for. Uh, the talk that we have next is going to be looking at fashion. Uh, fashion in this counterculture. As you know, the Boom Festival is a celebration of counterculture. And what one of the things that defines culture is our tendency to imitate, our tendency to express, but es express collectively. There's um, a similarity in the way that we choose to align as a tribe, as a community. And uh, the, the panel that's going to be coming up with a few people uh, here at Boom Festival is going to be called Dressing Out, uh, Dressing Out of the Box. And this is going to look at different ways that this fashion that's sort of emerged in this counterculture has come to be and perhaps look at it from different angles. And even in mainstream culture, our tendency is to conform in some way or at least to align. And it's based perhaps sometimes on certain values that we hold. Uh, same for this culture. And so they'll be discussing how do some of the values that this, this counterculture holds influence fashion and, 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 and do they always influence fashion? Is it possible for fashion to be conscious? So uh, I'd like to introduce our panel. Uh, Roberto Raval is going to be uh, moderating the panel this afternoon uh, with a few guests Greetings from the festival. Everybody. So please Greetings welcome everybody. Roberto. Nice that was already a very beautiful introduction. Um, yeah, dressing outside the box, actually, um, that was already a very um, extensive introduction. Um, we're here at Boom Festival and I think everybody had the experience that this is like a parallel universe, like a counterculture, a living counterculture, uh, a very vibrant counterculture. And still, if we look around, there are things um, that are similar to mainstream culture. And um, today we want to focus on um, the visual aspect and um, on the boomers, so we talk about fashion. And um, to do so, we have um, some fashion designers from this scene. Um, you've seen their clothes in the shopping area. You've seen their clothes, um, wearing, people wearing their clothes here at Boom. Um, please welcome Pedro from Natural Wear. He's from Spain. Welcome. Greetings. We have uh, Paulina from Chintamani, from Russia. <laughs> Next up, we have a Portuguese couple, up and coming uh, fashion label, Chimera Species. Um, please welcome Bruno and Susana. <laughs> and last up, I think most of you who are into trans fashion know Silo. Um, and we have here Kirsten oh. for Silo Fashion. <laughs> all right. Um, so I just said, um, I think in the introduction, we all heard the introduction. Um, uh, oneness is a big buzzword, is one of the mottos here at Boom Festival. We experience a oneness, we experience um, like we all can be like a beautiful community of people from different countries, from different backgrounds, speaking different languages. So oneness is a very um, strong thing we can experience here at Boom. Um, so my first question is um, fashion. For me, that is a lot, has a lot to do also with individuality. It gives expression to your individuality. And my first question would be um, how does that actually go together, individuality versus oneness? I think that, um, that the, through fashion we have the chance the, to communicate our way of uh, living uh, or our philosophy or in life, no? Because uh, it was the, like this in the past, no? Since since long way of wearing, it was uh, having a meaning in every old culture, no? So now. I think the, through in this time of uh, commercial, no, in every subject we go, uh, that the, I think the wearing the small project fashion, uh, we have the chance to to make the difference, no, and uh, to m give a small message about uh, how we live, uh, w what we like, no. And that manifests in the way we, we dress, of course. Um, yeah, uh, and all of us we we are wearing clothes. So, yeah. I think the, it, by choosing the materials you wear, you can get different 
energy also finally you can use uh, fibers natural fibers who has uh, different properties even in the more practical way about the this is smooth or breathable but also some uh, protective um, energy as hemp no it was a holy plant uh, yeah in the world all over the the, the, the cultures in japan or in, in india in malaya no so right. i think it has much more meaning than what we know now in the, at least in europe so it gives the chance no to connect with the let's stay one more minute with the um individuality thing um yeah. Fashion means um, giving expression to yourself, um, yeah. giving expression to your personality, and that is individual, or is it collective? Actually, to whom how? Uh, I think that uh, fashion is a very good way how you can uh, release yourself, like it's a sort of creativity. Somebody can sing, somebody can, I don't know, dance or something, but anyway, we cannot know each other, uh, and we can feel each other by how your soul feeling yourself or I don't know how you are looking like. So it's, um, I think it's very individual way like this. All right, um, you have any thoughts um, on, on that from, you, you just started your fashion label, is that right? You're pretty new in the, in the business, in the, in the trans fashion business. Yeah, we are, oh, we are working for three years <laughs> in the fashion business. <laughs> and in the end, what we do, we do it for ourselves. When we are thinking, we are thinking, I want this for myself. <laughs> and then, because we make maybe part of this community, peop other people will enjoy it as well. But in the end, it's uh, what I want, when oh. I want it, <laughs> how I want it. All right. Kirsten, do you have any, um, any thoughts about um, being individual in a, in a big crowd, in a oneness? Do um, you have any thoughts about that? Yes. Can you please pass on the mic? So, um, we try to, uh, Psylo started actually also on trans festivals, the, the idea, and um, so what we try to do is we try to combine all kinds of influences from all over the world, different tribes, different symbols, religions, in our clothes, and it's, um, for me, it's beautiful to see that people from all over the world wearing shirts with different um, uh, writings in Hebrew or in Arabic or, uh, or influence from Japan. And this is, this is what we try to do. Uh, um, this is how we try to express the oneness, that there's no, um, there's, there should be no order what each person should wear or each tribe or each culture. So we try to combine everything and then sell it to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but it's a, um, a nice inspiration. So you take inspirations from all of the world and yes. you just make them available as kind of part of the um, vibe we experience here at Boom. Um, I just want to come up with an example you probably know, probably don't. Um, there's a party, a festival, very, very different to Boom. Um, called Sensation Wide. I don't know if it's still happening. It, it used to be a European event, Sensation Wide. As the name implies, the idea of that festival was like a commercial trans house thing. I think first happened in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam. The idea was there was a dress code, a strict dress code, and that is you may only wear white. So that was part of the experience. Everybody, you were allowed to wear like, I don't know, boat shorts or, uh, or whatever you want, but only white. That was that. And um, so, the idea was probably um, to inspire fantasy and just to look at like people and look, look more in, at the eyes. And of course, people started wearing like special white clothes and all that. Um, what is your opinion? Is that like, we, we now want to talk a little bit about the spiritual aspect that um, evolves from wearing clothes and I seeing people that. around you. I mean, um, for all of us, it's a beautiful but experience to see all these multicolored people. Um, on the other hand, could you imagine like a boom in white? I would not sell nothing. <laughs> <laughs> all, most of our stuff are black. <laughs> there was actually a sensation black, as far as I'm. There was like there was more like um, up tempo techno. I think there used to be a sensation black. Um, but in terms of, um, do you think um, you just said you mix different influences? Uh, Kirsten just said that from uh, she she she's mixing. Um, different influences from, from the world to inspire people to have that feeling of oneness. 
Um, if people wear your clothes and if you see other people um, wearing your clothes, um, what do you think is the effect on the state of mind, on the mindset of a festival? I think the, there is two parts on the clothing that the, some part is more conscious, that is about the design and about the colors, and some other part is m more into the real properties, no? Energetic properties of the clothing or the intention you do, even the, how the system, uh, the system you follow to produce the clothes is in the clothes, I think, no? It is really going the very deep, no? And so it, I think it can change a lot, uh, not only because of the clothes, is sometimes I feel this in the shop, no? That people come to buy the clothes and they really like the concept and the way of life we have, all of us, no? So, I think when they see the cloth at the time, they remember the feeling, the festival. So it really affects in as much as you like, you know, as much as you put your intention, so it can affect to the people. No? Um, the concept of the cloth, um, that also includes the production, I guess? The production or even not only the system, you follow who is doing this system, no? I mean, for example, we choose not only to follow fair trade concepts or to choose nice materials, also to have to spend our money with friends, to, to be, who people who have similar concept of life, no? way of life. So finally, our product is full of very strong energy. No, each item it is full of love. Finally, no? because you take all the details. So really, it can be very simple cloth, like plain color, basic dishes, but well, big intention behind. No, so. Paulina, would you say your collections, your collections are a special energy, and what is that energy? What does it give to the crowd? Actually, I'm not as much going to give something, but anyway, uh, like as any of all people, I have a beautiful experience with traveling, with psychedelics, with coming to festivals, and uh, everybody sharing with this, like somebody come to friends and telling, wow, it was so beautiful. Somebody make after some drawing, something and uh, for me I find a way that I can bring all this expression to a material like material <laughs> uh, in my clothes so anyway I see like uh, I was so much impressed I'm making this and some people coming like wow it's what I was dreaming about it was what I saw in my dreams it was ah, and uh, it's making connection between us and now that's a very interesting keyword connection between us. I think that's very much what what boom is about. Like, yeah, that that again is oneness, isn't it? Um, yeah, sure. It's a sort of sharing. Like, look, I was so much inspired with this, and uh, after this, it comes like this. Wow, same to me, <laughs> like this. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that communication here at Boom? Uh, sure, I feel, and uh, I really enjoy because. Uh, I don't find so many places. Actually, I'm usually on these places, but uh, it was really nice to find one more, whether we can be really out of fences. I'm really feeling it every day, and it's more. I really enjoy it. <laughs> All right. Um, dressing outside the box, um, I just, um, we just talked about inspirations and communication at a festival, um, uh, how uh, clothes and style of clothes can actually be a form of communication. Um, is your collection inspired by festivals only, or do you draw inspiration from other areas outside festivals? I think it's a little bit from everything, from all around the world, on festivals for sure, on movies, on BD, a little bit of everything, our inspiration for sure, no? Comic books. Comic books. <laughs> comic books. Dark and side. And movies books. are beautiful. <laughs> Everybody loves Marvel when they are kids. Of course. <laughs> so give a little bit of expression to our alter egos. Do you see a lot of comic characters around here? Yeah, you see the cowboys, you see the ninjas. <laughs> you, see you see the pirates. The pirates, the sailors. You see a lot of... The fairies. The, 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 fairies. <laughs> the fairies, the punk rocks. You see a lot of different kinds of... Do you think that is like... And a lot of combinations. The most nice of, of it all is the combinations. Yeah. Um, you just said um, we all like comics when we were kids. Um, I still do. And so um, are there actually... Um, do you think that dressing up is kind of like children dress up and give yeah. try out things? Yeah. Or? In a way. Yeah, but we try to mix also with... Uh, Maybe for women not so time. much. <laughs> yeah. Women like to look better. We, are li we like to... <laughs> we like gadgets. I think men like gadgets, women like to look good. 
Would you agree, Kirsten? Uh, uh, would you agree? Men like gadgets and any thoughts about that? <laughs> it's definitely uh, like day and night to sell to women or to sell to men. Completely. <laughs> <laughs> What's your experience? But, uh, yeah. <coughs> men, they, they just, they're so easy then, they're so grateful for every t-shirt or <laughs> <laughs> you know, bracelet or whatever you show them. It's good, let's yes. go. <laughs> if they like it, they buy even three of the same kind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, women take, I, I, oh, this is my experience, yeah, women take um, expressing themselves through clothes much more serious. Yeah, then For then them, it's it maybe because they are more sensitive, or maybe because of our society. I, I I can't say, but I think that women have much more feeling of what color today, or if short <laughs> or not, or if you can see the knees, or if you can see. <laughs> the <laughs> so I, I, yeah, I think definitely there's a difference between men and women, but I wouldn't point it on gadgets and looking good. I think this is also individual. All right. Uh, you're a woman yourself. What do you think the difference between um, women and men um, in terms of clothes and in terms of what they like, what they like to express? Um, I think that I will not divide like men and women. Uh, for me, I really enjoy to make uh, set clothes, like uh, for couples. Like uh, it's uh, absolutely not like uh, men wearing men, uh, women wear men style or like this. But when it's matching, when it's something super teen, super nice for women, and same pieces used in men clothes, it's it. But uh, to feel different, come on, we are all human beings, and oh, yeah. it's yeah, for sure we have some different perception, but not as much. Do you actually um, brought, brought pictures? Did you, did you bring pictures today um, of your collection? Um, I perhaps we can just go into it. Um, I just saw we yeah, have it's one right here, but I think we got a yeah, folder right. with only your pictures. It's a flash, in, it's a flash into your eyes. It's not your eyes. Oh, we were already <laughs> in it. Flash, yeah, but you. <laughs> yeah, it's me. <laughs> That's your folder, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> not, not like me, but my clothes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, uh, what about your style of producing clothes? Um, how, what, how do you make a difference in terms of the production? We talked a little bit now about what you want to give expression to, what clothes um, can actually be used for um, as a in, in, in oneness or as an uh, item of individuality. Um, if you produce clothes, um, what's your approach? Where do you produce? Um, do you do it yourself? you have a team? Yeah. Uh, so I'm making my clothes in uh, Goa and on Bali. Uh, firstly, when I start, I was making it only by myself. Now it's coming like much and much and much more. So I invite people to work with me, and I really enjoy that I'm living in Asia and uh, in Asia, and uh, uh, I can share my some Western experience uh, with these people uh, to make uh, them more conscious making. Uh, more conscious uh, like uh, walking to share my experience in how they can use this or that mm, about some style I, uh, it, it was some task in some festival to define like what is the style of my clothes it's tribal it's uh, something i don't know really it's uh, very hard to define i just really it was correct my colleague uh, tell like you feel that you want to wear something you don't find it uh, all over around so what you can do, you can go and do it. And for sure, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of people who really enjoy it. Uh, what should it be? It should be comfortable. It should be more or less natural. It should be... Should it be organic? Yeah, it should. Actually, it's very questionable, because uh, uh, in this hour, Kali Yuga, it's uh, almost impossible to be really organic. Every factory, every production is anyway have some poison, making some poison. So what I, and anyway, like as for stretch cotton, uh, if you use 100% cotton, it will not be very good quality. You should add some 5% lycra and it will come good. People will really enjoy it five years. If you use only cotton, it's almost impossible. So like in our uh, making things, we should always find this balance, like to make it organic, but still quality, to make it, uh, I don't know, sexy, but still 
good. <laughs> no, but not too much because uh, this is what I want. Uh, what I make is what I want to support in a support in world uh, world around. What I want to bring to the world. So it should not be ugly. It should not be too much. Yeah, it's it's always some next step is a balance, balance, balance. It's. I would Everything. like to go a little deeper on that point. You just said 100% organic is not working. I think that is a very interesting point to talk about um, because organic, um, obviously, it's a very big issue today. And many, many people claim, yeah, we are 100% organic. You read it all the time on food. You read it on clothes. Um, can you go a little deeper into the actual process? What do they do with a fabric? Um, why is it better to add those 5% of synthetic material? Uh, maybe because he's, I know, <laughs> really very good specialist in uh, these organic styles. Of course, <laughs> let's uh, uh, let's yeah, switch to yes. our organic <laughs> specialist. Not organic specialist, just uh, we reach the point of organic, so we start to get more and more information, no? By doing, by <laughs> making productions, because I start from zero also. The thing is, I think instead of you, no, <laughs> I think that it's possible to make organic still. Just the, the thing that you have to spend so much time, it's not easy, no? But no, because now it became f kind of <coughs> commercial, also organic in every business. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Organic so sales. Also in fashion, no? Organic so, sales. So much, the most of people who, as factories, they, now they have also organic fabrics, no? For example, the thing, what I think is the best is to produce in factories where just you, they use organic fabrics. This is the first step, no? So the owner of the factory for sure will be organic. Freak. <laughs> the thing is the certification you talk yeah. about. And uh, so after there is so many certifications, no? So for example, there is one the I think maybe in your brand also use silo and uh, this GOT certificate in Europe is somehow one of the best because they take care of from where is grow the cotton and they make lots of the cotton so you can control even with by the CU number in which Container or which truck move to the factory, so you have you can have a real control. No? All right, and that is like a non-profit organization or um, uh, no? No, God is a, a company who certificate another companies who is, who are into growing cotton or manufacturing cotton or making threads. Mm -hmm. So you can trust them more than another ones. All right, and even also you can make uh, there is another kind of stamps that you can analyze the clothes. So mm -hmm. you can we can follow the stories the, of suppliers whatever, but we can analyze so we can see what is going on there, no? If there is chemical, harmful chemicals, heavy metals. So I think the, it is still is, is new thing, but already possible because for us it's new, but in, for example, in Japan, already more than 25 years, or they are making organic clothing and they are very strict. So for us it's new, but it's going and it's something real, no? And also, not only to get certificate fibers, also to choose which fibers. For example, before we were commenting, no, that the, now there is many bamboo fibers. Yeah, that no, they, they are maybe organic growing. They came from China. They have certification. They are organic, but the process to make bamboo yeah. into a piece of cloth. Yeah, the farming was organic, it's, but it's, the process is poison. Yeah, it's, it's more it's harmful it's than chemical. the chemicals on the field. So in the end, is it organic? The Chinese say it is, but in yeah. the end, is it? That's a very interesting point, I think. <laughs> um, can, can you also um, explain that process? He has a microphone. Um, uh, can you explain that process again? You said um, the bamboo is grown in China, and what happens? No, in China they have a lot of factories selling organic bamboo. Okay. But then I, I read the, in, in the newspaper about, about it, and it was that the entire process to make the f bamboo fiber into a piece of cloth it's chemical. And the chemical in the end is not so organic. And then I see many people saying I have bamboo, uh, bamboo lycra. <laughs> so in the moment you put lycra, it's, it, it's not organic. Because lycra, it's not organic. That would be end. like a vegetarian sausage I'm eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, but in the end, many people say, oh, no, I have bamboo organic uh, lycra, spandex, whatever. Right. Or if and not, they, they have like a piece, they say it's from AMP, for example, but that then puts metal buttons. So And the process to cast the brass, it's no longer organic. <laughs> organic, or the print, or the dyeing. I guess you guys, in your collection, organic, is that an issue for you at <laughs> all? <laughs> it's not a question of it is or it isn't. For example, many Me times I see alligator skin, and... I don't eat alligator skin. I don't eat alligator. 
If I would eat alligator, probably I would use alligator skin. It's or actually really delicious. Or, you know, for example, I refuse to wear a fox. Okay. I don't see the point of wearing a fox. All right. Most uh, what we use is cow and goat. So it's two it's animals that we eat. The earrings are made of bone and horn. horn. So it's the rest. So in the end, you use all the animal. The problem is we are too many and we eat too much meat. <laughs> all right. I think that's uh, the panel tomorrow. Um, <laughs> eating, eating meat. Um, but okay, so um, no, just about the leather. Do you do you actually leather. care um, how these um, these animals lived? Um, is that an issue for you, like the farming? That I think it's for the panel tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> because that in the, then again we are talking about food. All right, so uh, Kirsten, do you have any thoughts about organic fabrics, non-organic fabrics? I mean, it, um, it's only like it's a huge demand, isn't it? Like um, wherever you look, everything is organic. Um, wherever you look, um, is that an issue for you as well as silo? First of all, I want to say that I'm um, I'm the wife of one of the owners. It's not my company. I'm just representing them. And when I was talking to the designers and also to the owners. I asked the same question, and uh, and they said that for them or for us as Psylo, we ha we we put focus on something else. It's not that we not uh, try to do our best to to choose natural materials, to only choose mineral colors for our prints, but. Um, what we want to express is going to another direction, and if you focus on one thing, it's not possible to do everything perfect. So we, we, we buy as much natu natural uh, fabrics as possible from the area in Indonesia, only from there. And we will, in our new collection, we, we will make one collection with only natural organic cotton. But it's always an experiment. You never know what you work with materials, and then you make you make samples, and it's beautiful. But you're not wearing it for one year to see how it go, how it works, mm. and then you make one production, and then you get feedback from from, from the, the people, people that buy, and then you do it better every time. You do it better, and you try to do some something else. So. We are not focusing on being only organic. Our focus is in another direction. If you work at the shop here at Boom, do you get a lot of requests like, um, hey, do you have like an organic collection? Is that a big issue? Uh, yeah, more and more. <laughs> Especially men, I have to say, they ask a lot. All right. Yeah, I lot. see the man next to you nodding. Fake so you leather. Get it. A lot of people ask us for fake leather. Not fake. But it's called vegan leather. Yeah, <laughs> but vegan leather. Yeah, yes. But, yeah, but in the end, it's, it's, it's rubber. <laughs> It's made of plastic. It's made of plastic. It's made of plastic. Okay. So, um, I think at that point, um, Paulina would be um, a very interesting um, uh, speaker because um, she actually, what she's wearing on her hat is a feather, but it's not a feather. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, actually, uh, what I use in uh, my things, I make jewelry, I make clothes, and I make shoes. Uh, I'm trying to make all vegetarian. It's part of responsibility which I can really take for me. About this organic, not organic, I think this is more fashion. It's uh, all over the world fashion to be organic, to be natural, but uh, not as much deep information about it. That what, what, what can be organic, because even cotton production is very, very poison. Really, people who work in India on factories who, which make cotton, it's uh, really they could not work a long time there. But it's still 100% cotton, very organic, so it's <laughs> something not to be <laughs> exactly defined. Uh, about my clothes, uh, I usually use only vegetarian. I make even uh, for uh, like really warm things and use only uh, like uh, what I can, uh, like my colleague t tell, uh, vegetarian fur, the vegetarian uh, leather. Yeah, uh, about shoes, I'm also happy, like, uh, I have this experience only half year that I can make vegetarian shoes, because if you want to buy, uh, like, good quality shoes, you will find only leather. And for some people, it's really important, because it's some connection with ground and what you spend a long time in, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it's really important for some people to, that it will be cotton, that you can wash it, that all this. So I'm happy to 
start to explore this and to bring it to people. Um, did you get a lot of requests? Were you inspired actually by requests at festival? You were selling your collection at the festival and did many people ask you for, for that kind of, of clothes? Sure, because uh, like it's not uh, comes after request. It comes like after I feel uh, that I don't want to wear this leather shoes more. It was seven years ago. So what I do, I look around. I can wear some ugly things which I can buy in the fabric <laughs> and it's not good quality and all this. So what should I do? What should I do? I should do it. So I do and I see really many people who come on. It happens. I'm so happy that I can find you because it's what I'm thinking about. It's some co-connection, like uh, I feel or people ask, I even don't define. It's some mix of us, like this. All right. Um, Pedro, um, let's um, switch back to you again. You're very, very organic. You, you like a lot the organic. <laughs> yeah, um, we try, why not, you know? Do um, you get a lot of reaction on that or yeah, you get yeah, a lot of feedback? So much people interest and... Uh, they they want to wear organic. No? Even some people they just wear organic. Or for example, just pe some people just wear hemp. It's really many many people. I was surprised a long time ago. I start to have a organic collection, and uh, I stopped to do other things out of organic uh, items because uh, it was the thing that the people would like, no? And what we like. So I think the, it can be real organic, also. Sometimes, uh, for example, we use uh, raw fibers, no, 100% hemp raw fibers, that we can see where it is uh, grow this uh, this hemp, no. So there is no cheating, no nothing, you know. And this hand spoon, hand weaving, vegetable dye. So this is just made by people. They really, even the hemp or the nettle, for example, even they don't grow. Just they collect from the nature. So really, there is no cheating, no chance to cheating, no. Just in the knitting fabrics, it is more cheating because just became popular. So. Now, of course, every factory have organic, no? But I think we should, if you, we want to work organic, go with organic people. The people who just work organic, who just work with ESO free dyeing, because all the fabrics they have, it is free of heavy metals, all of, it, all of them. So in the storeroom, they will not mix, they will not toxify. The, so I think slowly, of course, if we don't trust the movement, it will never happen. But if we trust and we try, uh, slowly, slowly, we will get the thing we want, you know, because so much people with the same conscience. And we have to remember that since just 100 years ago, all it was organic. You know? <laughs> so, of course, it's possible. You know, because and a couple of years, a hundred years ago, uh, it was all made by the people, like you just said, just made by the people. Do you actually, um, are you in touch with the people who, who make Yeah, yeah, yeah. We um, spend, uh, when we are in the summertime, we are around the festivals, but winter time, we are more in production. So we spend uh, six months in factory. We go every day. We, we are with the people who is teach. We, especially we are we just produce in one factory in, in Kathmandu, Nepal, where just four people is teaching. So really big connection, no? When they are sick, I know. When they are sick, they call me. Oh, today I will not go. And tomorrow we <laughs> teach this. So really direct relation, no? Um, exactly. Where do you produce? I in uh, Kathmandu. All right. All right. We make the stitching in Kathmandu. We make the printing in Spain by our team, and we make some stitching also in Spain. And this winter we are starting a bigger collection in uh, stitched in Spain. Is um, the situation of the people in Kathmandu is that an issue for you? Um, do, uh, do you actually is that part of your business strategy? And um, what do you do um, in terms of the situation of the people working for you in Kathmandu? Uh, now, okay, Nepal, since maybe six, seven years ago, since the political situation is very bad, it's really difficult to, f to work in Nepal. Almost all, everybody left the country. But still, there are, because they have the culture of uh, raw fibers, and natural fibers is not fashion, it is tradition, you know. So um, there, there are people who were interested since many generations on fibers, on weaving, and so this is their culture. It's not that they do because of fashion or because of commercial. So. We connect with these people, and uh, we are like a team, you know. For with <laughs> this, uh, the our motor engine, it is the natural fibers, no organic fibers and natural materials. Were you inspired by the people who work there, um, like the, the, the I, craftsmanship? And um, I am inspired. I was shocked a long time ago when I traveled to South Asia, especially in Thailand. And I came because of another purpose is more studying massage and Ayurveda. And I surprised how tribes and how village people still they make natural dye, they make the fibers, they make the threads, they make the fabrics, 
All the ceremony clothes are made by hemp or natural fibers, and they make vegetable dye and batik. Still now, today, these days, they are doing every day, no? So I was in shock, like, wow, it survived. <laughs> this is not the story, this is just it's still alive. No? And so once again, they use barely any chemicals, any stuff they don't get directly from nature, is that right? Sorry, sorry? They, they use barely any chemicals for that. What do you... What do you what uh, about the, what I am talking, these tribal fabrics? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, they, some of them, of course, they already they are using chemical dye because they are on the market and people have not the knowledge. They don't do this because of uh, fashion or... They do just because it's the tradition. They Especially indigo. And they use indigo for making the dyeing. And, um, yeah, and of course, it's chemical things are everywhere. No? But still, people, is uh, is their tradition. For me, it's just something what I discover. No? For, but for the people I work, it is the, their life. No? And is it possible to do that in like a, a, a high number, the production? In volume, yes. The, of course it's possible. Just the need, uh, we need organization, I think, no? Just this. How does it look like, actually? How does your production look like? Is it like a big um, no, warehouse or no, um, very like a factory? A small house, the from outside, looks like a home, family home. In each floor, one the room, and down is a stitching, a storeroom, cutting. An office where we make inspiration, designs, and four people is teaching. No, two people is teaching. One cutting, one finishing, and another just the small jobs. And we are uh, me and some Japanese friends who have different hand brands, and we are around like family. You know, we there and really family style of work. You know, that I think it's possible. Beautiful. And even we increase the volume. You know, and by four people in one month, we can stitch big amount just because we organize very well. But I think no, it's not a problem. You know, Do you because think we are not reaching this volume of high companies. You know, all right. I Do mean, there is a, le a level in between. You know, in between is very small volume and medium volume that you can afford the quantity you need, and it still is easy to manage in proper way, no? But there is a limit, you say, like it would not, there would be a limit if you, the demand gets just that great, that um, you have to produce, 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 you, is it is it possible still? Do you think I it's thi possible I to think produce in a similar way? Sometimes in business we spend so much time just for how to make the business and the money and not much in organization and how to, to feel the people, if they are happy or not. And if we spend time, for example, we have now we have a cooperative of work. I am representing here, but we are three owners and 13 collaborators. If somebody is just organizing, just taking care of details, you know, possible. If just this is something what you will spend sometimes one day thinking about the situation, how you will work, not possible. But if somebody is 24 hours working <laughs> and thinking and focus on to get something, possible. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. Paulina, can you tell us a little bit about your, like, describe the production of your collection? Um, how does it look like? Is it a factory? Um, can you describe a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it's uh, still not a factory. It's, uh, like, limited editions. It's what I like, because uh, uh, factory production, it's everywhere. It's uh, every city you can come, you can find this crazy, like, unconscious. I, I name it, like... Uh, uh, dead, uh, dead fabric, like this. It doesn't have soul, it's don't, uh, not so much telling something. Uh, so it's uh, very limited editions and uh, mostly I make uh, hand printing. I have a great, uh, beautiful workshop in Goa and uh, I put printing by myself. And it's, it's really organic way of printing. Like uh, I remove color, which was put in on the fabric. Oh, exactly what is that? Uh, it's uh, like bleaching, I remove with oxygen uh, color from the fabric. It's a uh, way how I print. Also, uh, I print a bit uh, of uh, traditional Peruan uh, motifs, like uh, ayahuasca patterns, because it was my great inspiration to do something. She really, like, push me, like, follow your route, like, do something, like, uh, bring uh, to the world what you can want to see there. So uh, part of my collection is about uh, Madre Ayahuasca, part of my collection about uh, sacred geometry. For the moment, it's like I can't find better motives for to release. Maybe after will come, I don't know. Uh, I have a production in Goa and I have production on Bali. Uh, and I'm really happy to work with local people. Uh, but it's still uh, like uh, three for tailors, uh, which sharing responsibilities, same as my colleague, like somebody cutting, somebody stitching. Uh, Are it. you in close touch with, with your employees in Bali and in, in, in yeah, Goa? Yeah, sure. For me, I'm full freak about with whom I'm making my stuff. 
if uh, I feel that person is somehow look, not looking to the eyes, something, this, uh, I'm trying to make him straight. Uh, if not coming, I'm not working. Because for me, it's really important. I want to, like all of us to be in a conscious way of uh, communicating, of making things. And there is no reason to start making something if somebody is about his own reasons. So I really try to find people, even if it's person who print my cards or person who, <laughs> I don't know, whatever. But like all parts uh, that it will be really straight. For me, it's really important because if uh, I'm working in this way, I really enjoy and people really enjoy and we make what we make. We don't like really live with it. It's and uh, he definitely also finds expression in the in the clothes. Um, after all, um, of the, the finished product has all that. Yeah, I, I, I think yes, because it's it's coming like being really loved. Something that is like uh, it's really life. It's loved. It's uh, what uh, what is made. I might uh, you know like uh, on labels of clothes, people write like made on in Bali, made in Russia, made made in China. I like write uh, made in love. Like, um, <laughs> for me, it's like this. All right. It's what I am about in making things. All right. Um, we have in Bruno in and Susanna, you would be the next. We, year, have, we have made in planet Earth. <laughs> On planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> in big one. Then we have to have the one where it's actually made because of borders and tax purpose. Where would that, where, where, where would that uh, be on planet in Earth? In Indonesia. In Indonesia, yeah. all right. And um, are you living there? Are you in close Most touch Most of the, the time we pass there. All right. We live nine months a year. Uh, we work, we have our own workshop. We open in December. For details. Uh, just for to make the leather, so the accessories. And then we work with other five small factories to make the shoes, the clothing, the metal, the jewelry. So separate. And many of the pieces are made in all of those places. So some of the pieces take long time to make because they have to wait for one place to finish for the other to start. So in the end, one piece can go into five factories just to be made. <laughs> all right, but you, you're in touch with all of those yeah. factories. Well, yeah, yeah they, they it's even, just they me even and Bruno, so we make and everything. And they even come to our house to eat. We invite <laughs> them to come on the Sunday to our house to dinner. All right. We Portuguese are all about food. <laughs> all right. So I noticed that already, <laughs> inviting yeah. people to your house to eat. It's part of it. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Kirsten, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you produce, uh, like a little more exact? Um, exactly, we have some pictures from you, so we can start those pictures. How does that work? Okay, so um, hmm? the project Hello. Silo exists already for 12 years. And we have a small factory in, in Bali. Uh, we have 60 people working for us, and most of them are with us already for 12 years, so we know each one of them with name, and we know the families and, and the children, and, and yeah, it's, we have mostly men working on the machines. We have a few men making the prints with the, by hand. Um, exactly, where is it happening? I see you have like three different um, uh, places here. I see you have Bali as well, you have um, in Koh Samui, and mm -hmm. you have in, in London. Um, are you talking about Bali right now? Ba the production is in Bali, yes. All right, um, so we have and some pictures uh, from Bali. The partner of my husband uh, and designer of Psylo, he's living in Bali together with his wife. They take care of the design and the production. And so they're every day in the factory and every day working with the girls in the office. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a family, it's not just a factory. And we do everything in this factory, all our accessories, the clothes, the hats, everything. All the organization of quality control, of shipping, everything is happening in that place. It, uh, two years ago, because our factory became too small, we bought land and we built a new factory and we have much more space now and it's not so close to the city. It's, it's in a beautiful area where there's much more inspiration also. All right. All right. 
Um, so I hear a lot Bali, which undoubtedly is a beautiful place. I hear India. Um, I have to ask that question to all you guys again. Um, Asia, obviously, I'm wearing clothes pretty much from Asia, and they were produced in Asia because they, they, it's cheap to produce in Asia. It's very cheap to produce in Asia. Is that a factor for you, hands down, um, cheap in production? In the end, not so much. In the end, for me, going to Asia was for more for the quantities, because here in Portugal, you have really good quality on producing. But the thing is, you go to a factory and they ask you 500, 1,000, 10,000 pieces. Of the same piece, like 10,000 pounds, just the same. All right, that is something you find so in Asia. And in Asia, I can make it smaller quantities. All right. And obviously, my father is not a uh, Rothschild, <laughs> so I cannot say I want to start a company and make 500,000 pieces. You know, we start with very small quantities. Now we are getting bigger, but it's still not thousands and thousands of pieces. Uh, um, <coughs> we are producing in Indonesia because this is where the idea of Silo was born. My husband and his partner were living, traveling and living in Bali for two years and they were just partying and doing things. And then they had the idea to, to make the perfect um, festival pants. <laughs> and this is how everything <laughs> started. And actually they fell in love with the place. Bali is really beautiful. and. Uh, it's far away from from this world. It's like a bubble. It's so paradise and everything is beautiful. And paradise and chaotic. <laughs> yeah, of course you have everything <laughs> everywhere. But, <laughs> but they fell in love with the place. That's why they decided to stay the, in Bali and produce there. Not because of because of anything connecting to business. And actually, uh, more and more we're thinking about moving to Europe because. Um, yeah, because I think it's important to support other countries and not to, you know, it, everything gets very commercial in Asia because everybody thinks you can do clothes and everybody thinks you can do that and then everybody comes and then you have bigger factories, they produce them more and so that's why we're thinking to move to Europe actually. And I have other friends, also my friend Cassandra from Ofrendes, she has a shop here also. Also them, they, they found beautiful places in Portugal and they found exactly what they need, exactly what they have in Bali also. And they said, yeah, why not, why not to change? Why not make an adventure and move to a different place and work with different people and try to create what we want to express in a different place? I just wanted to say, um, uh, uh, Portugal, the economic situation is, I think, very difficult um, in, in this country at the moment. Um, so um, wouldn't it be great to get your production to Portugal? Um, apart from the fact that it's difficult to get low numbers, um, wouldn't it be beautiful to get it to your home country? And um, like No, the intention is to come back to our own country. Just the details, some of the details we have to keep doing there. But the intention is to come here. Even the quality is way better. All right. So if you want to achieve a bigger market, you need also better producing quality. And here in Portugal, we have it. We have all the machinery. We have all the technical skills to do it. So, Paulina, you have any thoughts about um, why you produce in the places? I mean, obviously, beautiful places, Bali, Goa, beautiful places to live and to work. But do you have any thoughts on um, the production, the conditions of production there, um, speaking of wages of the people who work there and, and these things? Actually, it's anyway a mix of all, because uh, 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 my project is traveling with me. and. Uh, when I'm even in Moscow, I have people to product something there if I need, if uh, something finished, if some very nice idea come. Uh, when I'm in Go, I work in Go, and when I'm on, on Bali, I also have very beautiful people to work there. So it's not so much uh, cost with the price. And actually, when I want to tell that uh, to work with really qu uh, qualified people in Asia, in Asia, it's uh, coming the uh, same price as you are making in Russia. It's uh, not running for some money, it's for sure. And uh, anyway, like all project was coming from inspiration from these places. So even when I take, uh, when in Moscow I take pieces from Bali, it's like really it's smelling with this uh, beautiful uh, everything, beautiful Balinese nature, beautiful, ah, it's 
wonderful vibe. So it's inspired by all uh, with all places where I am, and uh, it's made in. It can be made actually anywhere, anywhere, just uh, where I am and where I have inspiration. All right, Pedro, you have any any thoughts about um, like uh, the, the the treatment of the people who work for you? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I think very few people who have brands uh, like us dancing doesn't go to Asia because of the price. No, this is uh, like a kind of mythic. Thing. Is it is it really a myth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. And uh, we go there because of the volume, as he said. This I think is first thing, no? Because in Europe. Uh, also, business relations in Europe are very strict and serious, no? I don't know, people who went to Asia, they will know, of course, but it's much more easy to work sometime in Asia, no? And especially when you want to work together with people, people give everything, no? They, they work with you and uh, they support you. And in Europe, no, you are just a customer, you arrive in the factory, bring the designs, finish as much as possible, <laughs> as soon as possible, and go, no? And in Asia, it is live, no? slow motion. Uh, this catch me completely, no, to produce there. In my case, I produce in Nepal because uh, we are focused on hemp and this kind of motherland of hemp, no, Himalaya, because it's still growing net wild and uh, everybody uh, this into the culture of work hemp and make threads and natural fibers is the reason because I am there. Also, the vegetable dyeing is alive there. Also, many Japanese work there, so I, l I like this environment. What I cannot find here just a few things we will start to produce in Spain, but uh, when I talk with factories and I talk about the process we use for to make the cloth, because natural fibers are a little bit different and hemp, you need extra process, for example, proper washing. So people, when I go with my <laughs> system of work, they are, wow, <laughs> it's so complicated to work with these fibers. No? In Spain, in Spain. You in say Spain or in like Europe in general, because they work with more synthetic fabrics, no? So it is right. completely different. You cannot work in the same way, no? So, yeah somehow because we are in Asia, yeah. All right. Um, do you actually think, um, again, a question to all of you, um, your customers coming to your shops, um, do they actually, um, is it um, like an argument to buy or not to buy a piece of cloth, um, knowing that they were produced and they were fair trade, um, to put out that word? Yeah, I saw many people, in, especially North Europe. Wow, so much people! They come to the shop just because of the concept. I mean, the, the concept is first thing after the designs, no? But they really want to wear something what follow their philosophy of life, no? I, th I think they can buy the for the uniqueness. All right. Because Did you ever have a customer <coughs> who said like, "This is a really beautiful piece. I would love to buy it, but..." It's, um, it's non-organic, or it's uh, oh, I, yeah. don't, I don't know about most the most of them production. is because it's some of the pieces they have so much work on them, so they become expensive. So many of most of the people that say it's because they don't have money for it. But like did you did you actually hear at Boom Festival? Did you have like a, um, a customer who said like I would buy I like to buy that, but it's not organic or I, I think had one um, girl that would want some boots in uh, vegan leather. <laughs> it was the only one. That told me that. Yeah, but they they ask they ask a lot of times uh, where do we make and if it's fair trade and there if there's children they ask mm. me a lot of times. All right. Um, that and there is no children. <laughs> <laughs> In Bali, at least, I never saw really children working. No. Never. No. I mean, if you if you are just there, I working see them playing and driving motorbikes, but working. <laughs> Maybe mm. from the 16 or 17, they start to work, but not never before that, never. All right. And it's like here before in Portugal, it was a you learn a trade, because now we are formatted to go to school, go to the to go to university, get a job, and before it was no university. You go, you want to be, you want to make shoes, you go to work with the guy who makes shoes. And that's how you learn, so it's a learning process. And in Bali still works like, like that. that. So the tailor, it goes like, okay, with 16, 17, start to make, but more to learn than to actually l work, yeah. work, you know? Do you think that is a way of dressing outside the box, the name of this panel, that you actually also break out of the paradigm of the Western society um, and actually you wear clothes 
that were produced in another paradigm. I think um, sometimes we just forget there's like another way of thinking and perceiving There is many things. ways of thinking. Exactly. Um, do you think that would also be like a way of dressing outside the box, yeah? I don't know. Mm. Honestly... Do you got any opinion about that? Dressing outside of the box is expressing yourself in the end. That's it. Dressing outside the box is expe yeah, it's expressing. expressing yourself. In the end, that's it. All right. If you are organic, vegan, if you are the cowboy or the pirate or whatever. Where do you see the collective in that? If you say it's all about expressing yourself, is it just like, like a horde of people Be expressing themselves? Because or is there, there any is connection no at all? In creation, there is no emptiness. You don't create from nothing. When you create, is from your experiences, from what you see. And here you see a lot of stuff. You see, it's a place for a week that you have uh, loads of information <laughs> for saying. But in the end, it's about information, can come from everywhere. And in the end is that, like when you make, many times I make stuff for, and my friends see it, and they say it, it's not for me. You know, because they don't want to look a little bit different from the normal thing. All right. You know, they want to go to HM and Zara and they buy exactly the same and they are photocopies. Well, it's slightly different. But then there are others that don't give a fuck. So, hee hoo. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> and in the end, dressing outside of the box is all about that. It's committed. You are committed with yourself and you don't want to look like whatever. You don't want to look like whatever, so you want to look actually different. Like yourself. You want to look like yourself, or is, is yourself something different than the others around it's you? It's different, or? but in the end it's the same. You know, this is a question about what starts first, the chicken or the egg, you know? Because it's everything connected in the end. Pedro, you got any, any thoughts on that subject of um, the, the giving expression to yourself and how can, is that actually um, just yourself, is that your ego or is there any connection at all whatsoever to other yeah, people? I think the root of this feeling that the, about how to express yourself, it is coming also that we are coming from societies where it seeks the uniform, you know, like uh, many in the police have uniform, army people have uniform. Even some schools have uniform. All of us, we are tired of rules, no? Like, <laughs> I, I was in the army, I had uniform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The <laughs> only time I, ha I had a tear in my eye was when I see everybody in green and with a shave. <laughs> <laughs> it looks the same. You look 400 meters, you don't recognize nobody. But you don't think there's anything like a uniform for the side trans community? It's a kind of uniform. But the representing kind. a nice thing, maybe, so at least, the, because uh, the, uh, as I said before, this is a language of wearing it is in the, since the past, the way of communicate, no? And suddenly we have all this uniform from this army, police and this, but also this brand name uniform, no? like uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, you go in the world, it's the same design with the same print, the stitching, <laughs> with the same color, it's kind of uniform, no? Hiding uniform, no? <laughs> So I think this, wearing these small brand names is give the chance to support also another kind of business. No, it's, I think it's not just fashion. It's the chance to to change also the economic and uh, business system. No, depend how we organize this. And by wearing this, you support these projects. No, that would be actually um, the decision. I buy this, and actually um, I make a change by buying something. Yeah, I think by buying because now uh, we are living in a in a world that the companies move everything. No. So I think uh, before we were all the time thinking about community system, living in the forest, the having natural life, and, but we were suffering, you know, we were having, now we have child and we have no comfortable life and we realized, okay, let's play the game. You want to, we make company, we make company all together, we make a strong company also and we make an alternative and we change the thing, no? not to fight that other change. We will create an alternative, no? There's actually a thing you hear all the time. The uh, uh, politicians, actually, they're not in charge anymore. It's actually corporations, it's business happening. And um, if we take that, then we would really actually forget about voting politicians, but um, think about buying the right yeah, stuff. Yeah. Would you, or would if you, you became that and then you change it. <laughs> it's also a solution. What was that? You can also become that and then when you have power enough to change, you do it. <laughs> there is many ways to arrive there. Do you have it at all like the aspiration to, to no. make a change? No. <laughs> all right. <so. laughs> that takes generations. 
takes time. All right, but it's it's not the job of you two guys no. to to make to no. make a big change happen. No, our job is to make what we like and to create. To, to create, to not have the like somebody telling you have to do this and that and this and that because it's what the client wants. No, I do this and this because I want to do this <laughs> and this. That's it. <laughs> And at the same time, because in the end you want to create a family, you want all the, those aspects of life, and you have to play the game. As he says, <laughs> you have to play the game. But at least you are doing whatever... Can you please get up on the microphone? But at least you are doing what you want and what you like, so... All oh, right, yeah, <laughs> that is beautiful. <laughs> so you can actually turn out of the box is turning into an everyday life model of clothing. Yeah. Would, would you other, other guys agree? Do you see people um, dressing, especially for festivals? Like, is that like a temporary situation? Or do you see a tendency that people dress like at a festival in everyday life? Do you have any thoughts on that? Actually, most of all, I enjoy people who like not dressing specially to behave specially for something special. Like, um, if you are, I don't know, enjoy elfic style, you are elfic in your house, in your way of living, way of talking, way of perception, way of clothing, on a festival, uh, with your friends, on vacations, when traveling to some temple where nobody see you. Anyway, like, you are you, and you wear what you enjoy to wear. So, I feel like my clothes can be like this. Uh, it's not like... Oh, I, from the very childhood, I was dreaming to become this, and now I'm like becoming. It's just, it's just you, how you live, how you percept, how you feel yourself comfortable. Even if you don't plan, do you see um, like trans-inspired fashion on the streets of big cities on a big scale in, let's say, ten years or something? Do you see that trend just as a vision, just as an idea? Do you think that's possible? One more time. Do you think trans fashion um, yeah. could actually become somewhat mainstream fashion being seen in big cities like on a large scale? Actually, it's, uh, it's already like this. Cause, yeah, it's already uh, happening. Uh, <laughs> for example, I don't know, uh, long skirts, uh, which in India is so much popular and uh, from very, very, very old times. And uh, maybe, I don't know, so se seven years ago it comes like super popular in big cities or this Alibaba pants or something. It's uh, some mix and it even seems like uh, it's really coming from this subculture. Uh, Sometime for this uh, area to be modern coming and it's coming to be mainstream. So it can be like this, sure. All right. Is that your experience as well? Do you see a lot of your customers um, like in everyday life? Yes. Uh, usually this is part of our concept to make clothing that everyone can wear in daily life. Some pieces we make more festival, more unique pieces that maybe in daily life depend which job you have is not matching very well. But I think yes, slowly, slowly, I think also fashion is moving. No, because we are getting also all this movement is bigger and growing. So suddenly we are not just a small part of people. We are so many people. No, so we are. I think it's changing, and uh, also some people they were just for the festival. But uh, maybe this is the beginning of inspiration. Or why not? You know. They you think you think there's any change in? I mean, um, no, in, the, the, in the in the in the no in the wearing. But the, why they decide to wear it is something going on there. You know, maybe they are tired of their job. They come to the festival. You know, they are in stress. The the beginning beginning of I want change. to wear the most uh, colorful for your shop. The beginning of change. Because I want to break <laughs> the, this rule. They give me this uniform every day. I quit. Time. I quit many <laughs> jobs to come to Boom. Uh, and I quit one of them because I came to Boom. So because this is a cha easy it changes change. something yeah. in your life for sure. <laughs> so after all, if, you, if, if we think about trans fashion becoming or already being more and more mainstream fashion, does it eventually have a like a, a will it cause a change in society? Um, is that like one like symptom of of change happening? Do you think? Change in the, it's a long process. I think um, uh, Kirsten wants to say them, something. Um, we we now uh, saw that uh, we had a, we had some ideas before, like um, how um, trans fashion gives expression to you, gives in some way also expression to a certain state of mind, to certain ideas, to like yeah, being outside the box. And now we see that it's already happening. You see it more and more on streets in everyday life. 
Do you think that means that we already have like a change happening? We have more people with a particular state of mind out there? Yeah, but I don't think it's uh, regarding to fashion, not only. And also it's not just depending on, uh, on us making the clothes or on the trend scene, what people are wearing. It also depends on the consciousness of the people who are wearing the clothes. It's not just uh, our clothes influencing the world uh, by becoming mainstream. I think, uh, regarding to this mainstream question, I think that fashion in general, it's like waves. It starts and then it floats and it disappears. And again and again, it's not really something bad or good if it's mainstream or not. It's it's just happening. And, of co and I think the people in this kind of festivals, like Boom Festival, are yeah, I'm, I'm more conscious than people than I meet in everyday life. Not always, but yeah. So people that wearing these kinds of clothes, I think they may be more in tune in what they want to express by themselves and maybe what they want to change in the world. So yes, I think it has an influence, but at the end, everything changes all the time. So. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I think um, that's a good good point to wrap it up. Um, uh, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, dress outside the box and yeah, um, just live and make the change. Thank you very much. Any so questions the from the audience about these particular fashion labels here? Hi. Um, with the leather garments, um, I just wanted to ask, like, how does that sit with you ethically? Because like, obviously an animal has had to die for that fashion garment. Uh, thank you very much for the question. <laughs> I think that was in a lot of people's mind. And yeah, um, it's more and more coming into the consciousness of also of the trend scene that uh, all the leather that we are using is from animals that had to die, especially for the leather. We all want to believe that it's an animal that we ate and we're just using the leather because it's a way of recycling, but it's not anymore, you're right. So um, what Psylo tried, we tried a collection with vegan leather and it was a disaster. <laughs> and uh, yeah, but we are working towards this. We, we are very aware of the fact that there's um, there's a pr there's a this problem that animals need to die in order so we can buy our 20th pairs of shoes or the 50th belt or something like this. But on the other hand, I think what I like about uh, all this fashion of my colleagues and also of others, uh, this scene is very connected to natural materials and leather is a natural material. There's nothing in the world that you can compare to leather. It's breathing, it keeps you warm, it's tight like a skin. It it's lasts a long time. <laughs> it lasts very long, yeah. So there, there is a, there is, it, it's difficult. It's difficult to find a substitute or it's difficult to even, you know, it's uh, me, for example, also me, I'm vegan and I'm, I'm not buying leather, but the ones that I have, the shoes, I'm wearing them already for 15 years because it's the best shoes ever and I, I, and I don't want to put myself into plastic. This is also not what I like, so it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to find a solution. Any other opinions from, from the stage? I better not to talk. I think many people will hate me after this, but I'm a meat eater. I cannot stop eating meat. I know I should eat less meat, that's for sure, but I will not stop eating it. And as long as I, as I eat it and other people eat it, at least I use all of, them, of the materials. It doesn't go to the garbage or to waste. Yeah, but you are not going to the factories, to oh, the no. places where they, oh, they, where, eat they eat, where they make the meat and you take from them the leather, the cows that they you eat are them using. for sure. I don't know. I would eat them. Yeah, but you are not in control. <laughs> 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 about this leather, leather subject, no? that we sometimes we feel lost about what to use, no? especially because we want to follow the same uh, texture. No? But the, in the past, uh, until they did forbidden all over the world, uh, when we need uh, something strong and breathable and uh, long life, we use hemp since the, since the past. No? 
for example, in the boats before, how you say, I didn't even I don't know in English, how you say the, the fabric of the boats to you, how you call this in English? This big I'm fabric to use wind, the wind boats? Sail, a sail. A sail. Yeah, sail. Before all the sails were made by hemp. No? The, the Portuguese past. and the Spanish conquered the entire world on hemp sails. On hemp sails, on, yes. on hemp ropes and even, hemp clothing. Even before we were talking about even yeah. army uniform were made by hemp <laughs> and nettle also. I mean, that, just the thing is, these fabrics were, were vegetable source. They were forbidden, even they're still forbidden in many countries. So it, it, still they are not around, but I think hemp will give the chance to make a substitution. Even in me, in the past, I, I started uh, designing, doing leather, and I changed uh, leather, all the pieces would have leather, I changed by hemp, and good result. Yeah, but you have not the same texture, you cannot get the same things. But, not yes. the same thing. but sometimes. <laughs> I'm born in Germany, and there's almost six months, snow and rain, it's very cold, and the hemp jackets not always keep you warm. And I know in Scandinavia, you know, 500 years ago, people were also, that's what they were wearing because it was cold. They were wearing leather because that's what they cover themselves with to keep them warm. So yeah, to find a substitute for this is not easy. Polyester. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say? Ma I think also market is not ready for this subject. So. Just if many of our brands, many of the people are interested, we will have it because come on, we go to the moon, we go everywhere. <laughs> this is not that the, now suddenly we need. The, yeah. There is, so I think they, we can create the, another alternatives. Yeah. On the same subject, at the end of the day, there are people that live so far north, as you say, they need to wear fur coats and stuff to stay warm. They can't actually, if you go far enough north be vegetarian because there's no vegetables up there, yeah? When the consciousness of a planet reaches a stage when we're all concerned enough, only those that need leather will use it. Yeah? Very good. Yeah, I think all in this point also that the, when the quantity of leather is not so big, also animals dead by nature, no? and so we can use this leather as in the past, you don't need even to kill to use the leather. No? In the past, the only people that had leather were the rich. We suffered the cold. It was a luxury item. Make it a luxury item, again, when only a few people are eating meat, yeah? and there are only a few leathers to be used. Would that be an option well, for you to have like a collection um, from like ham fat, um, cattle or whatever, or goat, and um, you sell it at a very high price and you take really care of that animal? Would that be an option for you, like just as an idea? I think if I would be in charge of this project, I would not be able to kill the animals at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the point. Yes. So yeah, but, um, but Silo definitely is... Uh, is focusing in that direction to to find find different ways all around all this animal killing industry. All right. And it, <coughs> the leather pieces cannot be cheap. Many people ask us, but why it's so expensive? A part of the work and the price of the manufacturer. That's also a question. It cannot be cheap. It cannot be an everyday, every person item. We are millions of people. Any more opinions? Any more comments? I see hands up. Uh, how can a person uh, combine in his or her own heart um, an, um, uh, an idea of peace, love, uh, unity, and, uh, and respect with, uh, with leather boots or uh, jackets and so on and wearing death. <laughs> Thank you. It, I think it's the same when I go at, eat at lunch and I order a steak in the end of the day. I'm sorry to tell you guys this, but I eat m steaks almost every day, twice a day. What should I do? I should kill myself? No. I should stop eating? I tried. I was in withdrawal. <laughs> What do you want me to say? <laughs> I went in Indonesia, I eat most vegetables, and I'm dreaming about many of the dishes I have in Portugal, and they are made out of meat. 
in the end, I cannot change it's a process. I cannot say I'm changing tomorrow, because I, I won't. And if I say, I was lying to myself. And part of my culture, as I was growing up, we eat a lot of meat in Portugal. What to say? As this is a transformational festival, I was wondering if you work also on a more holistic base, like trying to actually transform the people that see the fashion that people are wearing from you, or that it actually changes the person that is wearing your clothing on a spiritual level. On a Change doesn't come from clothing. Are you Change doesn't come from... But could it be, could it be possible? Change from you and from your experiences and from your thoughts. I'm just trying to say that, for instance, I mean, we're trying to uh, use less chemicals on our skin because it enters the skin mm. and it influences even your personality. So I can just as well imagine that the colors that you wear, the fabrics that you wear, they make contact with your skin. And yeah. I was just wondering if you're conscious about that and if you're doing anything You try with to that. minimize it. Try to minimize what? <laughs> Essence? Mi no, to minimize the chemicals in contact with your body or the overexposure to all those stuff. But well, I'm not talking about negative things. I'm trying to a question whether you are actually provoking positive effects of your clothing, whether they are seen or whether they are worn. I honestly don't know how to answer that. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> if they do, well, it's good. If they don't, well... Yeah, I think that uh, each one of us has his own uh, focus of uh, what we want to express with our clothes and with our, with our projects. And it's not all the same. It's not that we part of the trend scene, so we all want to be organic and we all want to be this and we all want to be Everybody has its own expressions. And f I can say for Psylo that uh, we are heading in a different way. We, we try to, uh, we are a peacemaking project. That means our designers is a couple of, he's, uh, the man is, is from Israel and the woman is from Iran. And the other partner, my husband is Israeli, I'm German. And, uh, and we have many Muslims working for us in Portugal and we all try to be all the time aware of the fact that we are not different from each other and we're working all together in one project. This is what we try to focus on, to, to combine people. We, we are responsible for them also. They make their living, they, they feed their children. So we try to influence them through making something with Psylo, but this is, this is where we had. So we're trying to make it as natural as possible, but as I said before, we, we put focus on something that is important to us, and then we put focus on the other things, and there's things that have priorities. And yeah, but we're trying. Uh, with every new collection, we're learning more, and we're trying to be more aware, and we're trying to use different fabrics, we're trying to look for different fabrics in different countries. And yeah, so we're trying. <laughs> Uh, we came in a little bit late, so I'm not sure if I missed this at all, but I hadn't heard anyone mention it so far. Um, I love leather and I also eat meat, just to put that out there, but several years ago, there's a collective where I live in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, that craft with leather and stones and they pride themselves on making sacred garments where we really tune into the medicine of the animal that's being used and so I'm not sure if that was commented on but there was a comment that came out about wearing death and all this kind of thing and using leather and um, if it's transformative and stuff for myself I know that it's been really important for me to tune into the animal medicine whether it be goat or snake or buffalo or deer um, so I think that that's one thing that I just wanted to throw in at the end. Uh, and as far as the, the leather industry being fairly destructive and using a lot of, you know, a lot of leather is out there. It's out there. These industries are out there. And I think that the roots of it becoming a tribal um, fashion is that we're all a tribe which are using our collective energies to 
transcend negativity into love and into peace and into growth. And uh, so that's like this is the kind of comment that I wanted to put out there is these leathers that were sort of made in a harmful way. I think if we take it into ourselves and transcend the energy that was put into it in the way that we craft it into a garment and wear it and how we put ourselves out there in the world, um, that we're a tribal culture and getting back to the roots of those tribes and that ties in with the whole fashion. And so um, I just wanted to put that comment about tapping into the medicine of the animal and transcending that negativity and destruction that's been put into that industry and using our consciousness and our hearts to transcend it. You know, thanking the animal for its life, that we can wear it and come to a festival like this and show our best colors or our best skins. So, cheers. It's a good conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was dressing outside the box. Um, thanks to everybody. Have a beautiful boom.